Western Australia was chosen in the mid-1960s as the site for OTC's first ever satellite earth station. Since that time, OTC staff at Carnarvon have played a key role in supporting space-related operations for the International Telecommunications Satellite Organisation, Intelsat, and more recently, the European Space Agency. They've been instrumental from the very beginning in providing vital communications links between Australia and the world. But now, the station's role is being scaled down, ending with a transfer of operations to OTC's new International Telecommunications Centre at Nangara, near Perth. I've been the receptionist at the Earth Station for five and a half years now. I've lived in Carnarvon for 10 years and it is a lovely town to live in. There's very many activities that one can be involved in and overall a very pleasant place to live. Carnarvon's main industry would be the plantations. We have big banana plantations and also small crops we provide vegetables to Perth. That's one of the, that is the largest outlet. Also the fishing industry, since the small boat harbour was built here, it has attracted more fishing boats to come to Carnarvon for the fishing season and the abundance of uh, prawns, scallops and fish from this town is really fantastic. The station became operational in August 1966, with its first task being to provide tracking, telemetry and command functions for NASA's Apollo missions. I was the supervising technician at that stage and worked under the then station manager, Mr. Leo Marnie, uh, head office engineer Gus Bersons and Don Kennedy. We were the labour for the Page Engineering Company. We worked in conjunction with them, digging trenches, laying cables, and virtually putting the whole station together. I arrived in uh, Carnarvon about uh, 13 years ago. I very clearly remember the day after a 600 mile, very hot trip from Perth, uh, we arrived in Carnarvon in the middle of a dust storm. The temperature was in the 41, 42 degree centigrade area. Uh, the houses were absolutely brand new. There wasn't a, a blade of grass, a weed or anything green. They were completely surrounded by sand. And uh, it's at times like that when you begin to wonder whether you've actually done the right thing in coming or not. We are here at this very early hour to make another step forward in television history. One which, we hope, will bring us the most distant person-to-person -person television transmission yet undertaken in the world. A step which should forge a new link between Britain and Australia. And these pictures are not going to be any pompous travelogue, no great fanfare of trumpets, no uh, pictures of Canberra, the great open spaces of the Australian continent, no exchange of messages between prime ministers. We're going to make this a family occasion. Come in, Kim Corker, and it looks as if you've got a lovely summer afternoon down there in Western Australia. 
Hello, Raymond Baxter. Yes, here we are. It's 2.30. Your timing is right. The day is right. I feel like a general about to lead off a, a small army here, as so many of the townspeople... Carnarvon Earth Station's role came to prominence in Australia and the world when it transmitted and received the first ever satellite television pictures into and out of Australia in November 1966. The event was a major milestone in Australia's telecommunications history. People make Carnarvon and we're a pretty varied lot. Down Under uh, Comes Up Live was an exchange between Carnarvon and London via the Goonhilly Downs Earth Station in the United Kingdom. The event was made possible by using an Intelsat 2 satellite which went out of control following a launch mishap, but which momentarily drifted into a suitable position for the telecast. Oh, Les, it's lovely to see you again after all these years. Now. And Lolly, thank you so much for your lovely letters you sent me. It was a momentous occasion for the people of Carnarvon. OTC, together with Telecom, the ABC and Australia's commercial television stations, put video cameras around the district and assembled a program in which the whole township was involved. Well, out of the tracking station, we're getting all ready for the man in the moon shot. We've been doing a number of tests and things seem to be going fairly well. We hope that when the three-man capsule does get off, that it'll go as well as the last Gemini series. Of hazy glimpses, interrupted conversations like those we've had this morning is the history of television made. To you in Australia, good afternoon, have a good weekend, make the most of that lovely weather as we here in London say to each other good morning with the prospect of a further day's work ahead of us. Goodbye to you all. In 1969 there was a requirement to upgrade the quality of the circuits involved with um, a polar mission and this was um, provided by the uh, establishment of the uh, 32 metre 97 foot parabolic uh, antenna um, and at the same time in 1969 this released basically the 42 footer for a contractual basis to Intelsat to provide telemetry, tracking and command facilities for the um, communication satellites which existed at that time in the Pacific and Indian Ocean region. Over the years, Carnarvon staff have been involved in most of the space programs associated with Intelsat and the European Space Agency. The Mariner series, Surveyor, Apollo, Pioneer, Skylab and Space Shuttle are household words in the field of space technology and Carnarvon has provided support functions for all of them. One of the earlier, well-publicised missions in which Carnarvon was involved was Apollo 11, the first manned lunar landing in July 1969. A very significant rock, typical of what we have here in the Valley of Torres Mitchell. Fantastic, sports fans. Good afternoon. Right away, Houston. That's your good. The variety of equipment at Carnarvon has provided OTC technical staff with a wider range of experience than could perhaps be gained at any of the other stations. In addition to its communication facilities, Carnarvon has provided access to the Intelsat and ESA equipment associated with the station's telemetry, tracking, command and monitoring functions. Six, five, four, three. Launch support provided for the Galaxy satellite was typical of the key role played by Carnarvon staff. We have a lift off. Tower cleared. The spacecraft uh, was launched from Cape Canaveral at 
at uh, 22.18. Uh, just for the record, it was 535 milliseconds late lifting off. Uh, Intelsat supports various non-Intelsat launches as part of their uh, procedures. And we are supporting this Galaxy vehicle, which is purely for domestic use within the US. Address 77 is selected. It's uh, quite a large satellite and it has uh, direct broadcasting facilities from uh, satellite to uh, ground for television and for data. After this launch, we have no further commitments for launches until the end of our contracts, which winds up at the 31st of December this year, 2359, which is the absolute end of the year. At that time, the system can be depowered and most of the equipment will be going to the new uh, TTNC facility at Jati Lahur in Indonesia. T minus 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10. We are go for main engine start. 7, 6, we have main engine start. 3, 2, 1, and liftoff. Liftoff of Discovery and the first flight to retrieve and return satellites from space and the shuttle has cleared the tower. OTC's last major role for the Intelsat organization was to support the Space Shuttle Discovery's rescue mission of the Palapa and Westar satellites, which had failed to reach their required orbits after launch in February 1984. And we have a beautiful full moon today. After a chase lasting two and a half million kilometers, American astronauts Dale Gardner and Joe Allen found the Palapa satellite spinning uselessly in space. The Discovery's robot arm was not fully effective in retrieving the satellite, so man replaced machine, thanks to the weightlessness of space, and after a five-hour tussle, the errant satellite was anchored into Discovery's cargo bay. This success was followed by the recovery of the Westar satellite, which was also placed into Discovery's cargo hold for the trip back to Earth. The astronauts travelled some five million kilometres in eight days and completed the first space salvage mission in history. The Discovery swooped down to a dawn landing with the two rescued satellites tucked safely into its cargo bay. With the sun glistening on its wings, the 100-tonne shuttle returned to Earth with all the ease and precision of a jetliner. It seems the Carnarvon story will have an ending to match its glorious beginning. The station's last major role before closing down forever will be closely related to Halley's Comet, an event that's sure to attract a blaze of worldwide publicity in March 1986. In 1980, OTC entered into an agreement, and I understand signed a contract with the European Space Agency, known generally as ESA, to install equipment, several antennas here for the object of making or sending a spacecraft into orbit to make encounter with Halley's Comet. Now, this is known as the Giotto mission. We will be the prime uh, space or deep space station that will be controlling the Six. movement of Six. the spacecraft all Six. the way until it enters its encounter phase, which will be one or two days before the actual encounter with Halley's Comet. Halley's Comet has always been a source of fascination for people on Earth. In 1066, it appeared before William of Normandy, conqueror of Britain and subsequently found its way into the Bayeux Tapestry. And in 1301, Giotto di Bondoni portrayed it as a star of Bethlehem, which guided the Magi. And now, a technological Giotto is set to rendezvous with the comet itself. Its instruments powered by solar panels, the probe will travel through deep space towards its encounter with what many experts think is a dirty snowball of water, ice, dust and gas. 
when it reaches the comet's nucleus, Giotto will have just four hours to photograph and analyze the comet and send the data back to Earth. This is the European Space Agency equipment, and in the same way that we supported launches for Intelsat with the SHF equipment, uh, this does exactly the same thing uh, at VHF. The ESA equipment has become increasingly important to the Carnarvon station. With OTC's contract to Intelsat expiring at the end of 1984, there'll be an increase in ESA-related activity at the station. And as well as supporting launches in the VHF band, Carnarvon staff will be supporting future S-band launches. Jarl with uh, OTC personnel is not necessarily the best thing or the best way of living, but in this particular case uh, it has advantages. The street itself uh, offers a wide variety of interests from the staff. Uh, one can always get a game of tennis with somebody in the street or a game of squash or uh, by not going very far to look for a, a suitable partner. Social activities at the rec hall are always attended by both the Earth Station personnel and the CRS staff. In fact, with the impending closure of the Earth Station, I feel a degree of sadness. I wouldn't uh, particularly like to continue living in Carnarvon uh, with the Earth Station closed and uh, the houses occupied by people other than OTC people. Uh, the townspeople and myself were initially, again, shocked that the station was going to close down. Uh, however, I think it's been explained to them pretty well by uh, parl parliamentarians and people from OTC, and I don't think the initial impact that they considered uh, is going to be as acute now as it, what they initially thought. Um, I think they're coming to accept the fact that OTC will eventually close down and they're going to have to make the best of it. There's nothing we can really do about it. Oh, I feel very sad about the station being closed down. I was here at the building of it and to seeing it being wound right down now gives a, a person a sense of loss. Not only to me, I've spoken to a lot of people in the township here and this is part of uh, Carnarvon now. New technology means satellite Earth stations can now be located much closer to high population centres than in the past. And if OTC is to hold its position as Australia's provider of international communications, it must be in a position to meet the growing demands of its users. Position factors that must be taken into account when looking at the provision of the best possible service to users. It's never easy to end a relationship that's lasted two decades, but the events of the past 20 years, the good times and the bad, will become an important part of Australia's telecommunications history and that of the town itself. OTC's Carnarvon Satellite Earth Station staff, past and present, can look back with pride at their involvement in such a major undertaking.